Okay, next, our next speaker is Mitzi Cardenas from Truman Medical Center. She's a senior VP of strategy, business development, and performance integration. Um, Mitzi is an exec executive with more than 18 years in the healthcare and health IT industry. She came to Truman Medical Center as the chief information officer with, with responsibilities for developing leading clinical and administrative information systems and technology. She currently serves as senior vice president which already says um, strategy and um, performance integration with the responsibility for strategic planning, new business, and real estate development, and performance analytics while continuing to lead the IT organization. Thus, the ever expanding role of the CIO. <laughs> um, prior to joining TMC, um, she held leadership roles at Children's Medical Center in Dallas, TRICARE Management Authority, Baptist Health. Um, system in San Antonio, Texas, as well as a variety of technology and healthcare vendor organizations. She received her bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Texas at Arlington and a master of science degree from Troy State University. Thank you. All right. Now that I have a pause, I guess we're done. Um, first of all, I want to say that everything that Greg said, I absolutely agree with. So my life is so much easier because I have a great CMIO that I work with at Truman. Um, we're going to talk a little bit. First of all, I want to explain a little bit about my current role because if I were looking at that, I'd be asking what is she doing. Um, one of the things we'll talk about is um, kind of how the role of the CIO is changing. And so as Linda said, um, a lot of my role has changed and I've kind of globbed on additional responsibilities. One of the things that we've seen in our organization, and it actually is becoming a little bit more prevalent, is that because the CIOs are having to get so involved in the strategy of the organization, that there are a few instances across the country where um, CIOs are taking on a chief strategy officer role. And it's really pretty cool because we are, um, we're really needed at the table for most decisions and most things that the organizations do now. And um, so uh, it's, been a, it's been a great opportunity. Um, oops, no, that's not one. Do I use this? Yeah. Sorry. Well, you'd think the CIO could operate this. There we go. <laughs> All right, so um, just a little blur about Truman Medical Centers for those of you who don't know, we're in Missouri. We have two hospitals. We have about a little over 50 clinics. Um, we have we do a lot of behavioral health. We have an urban core or a, a component as well as um, a hospital and leave summit that's more of a community model. A um, couple of things that are important, and I was just talking to Paul about this. We have we are now on stage seven um, HIMS analytics, which one of the greatest things about that is that when we are at, when we're applying for grants or providing other kinds of information, all we have to say is that we're stage seven and we don't have to provide a lot of text around that now. Because people in the industry know what that means and they see that as, you know, you've reached, achieved a certain level, so that's good. Um, the other thing that's pretty neat is our CEO, John Bluford, just achieved the CEO IT Achievement Award for Modern Healthcare and his um, blurb was in the latest Modern Healthcare. So he has been, uh, um, has been very supportive. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Can you want me put that on? Okay. Okay. I'll do that. Um, he's been very supportive of um, of IT and of the IT organization, and has always seen IT as a very thank you uh, as a very strategic asset for the organization. So that's again one of the reasons why we have great opportunities there. Um, so the Kind of the answer to the question of how CIOs prepare for the impact is I'll give you three words. I don't know. I don't know how, I mean, it's kind of like I was describing earlier. It's sort of like going into um, having a boat take you to the middle of the ocean and then kicking you overboard. Because a lot of the things that, have, that we have done and that, that we have learned, and, and this is kind of across the, my peers as well, is, is sort of by uh, virtue of trial and error and just sort of kind of being immersed and having to support the organization in those kind of things. So I'll talk to you a little bit about how the CIO role is changing from my perspective and also some of the experiences I've had and the learnings that we've had as we start to go down these various new opportunities that we have because of all this data that we have. So um, 
a little bit about uh, preparing for some of the new payment realities. You guys have talked about that all day. So we have a need for business intelligence, performance improvement. Um, we have to measure more than we ever have. Clinically, we've always measured a lots of things. We have core measures. We have all those kinds of things. But now we're really measuring ourselves as an IT organization, not from a standpoint of um, how we, uh, how many calls we take at a certain time. Please still not hear me. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Now? Um, but also from a standpoint of what kind of benefits we're bringing by use of the systems to the organization. So we track things, and I'll show you one of our scorecards in just a minute. We track things like um, how we're progressing on meaningful use and um, how we, how through the tools we're using, we're uh, minimizing our pressure ulcers and how we're lessening falls and a lot of other kinds of clinical measures as well as we do do some transcription and how that transcription is, is going down in numbers. So, um, so again, for the role of the CIO, I think we are becoming much more strategic than we've been before. Um, we still have to keep the operations going. So a lot of the, the impact and preparing for the impact is really about how we resource some of this stuff. And that is continually challenging. Um, I think everybody's talked a little bit about resources and the challenges we have around resources, but um, the other thing that's important is um, that I have found and actually been able to be pretty successful with at Truman is educating the board and the leadership team of Truman about what we're doing. One of the things that I found in my long career in IT is that IT organizations don't always do such a great job of letting people know what and how they do things. So we have always been known as um, the people that imparted change upon the clinicians, the people that, the big black hole, because things go in, they never come out. Um, but we really have to educate the organization on our processes. We have to educate the board. And um, um, I think that a lot of the, um, the legislation, our legislation, and the focus around meaningful use and all these things we're doing has really helped us be able to have that conversation. But it's a continual communication, to Dr. Ayer's point, with, um, with those folks. Um, we now are really responsible for health outcomes. So unlike in the past, where we didn't, you know, we had HIPAA, and we had some compliance things we had to be responsible for, we, I think, have a role in health outcomes, in providing the information to the clinicians so that they can make decisions at the point of care and when they need to, and they can look at populations of people so that we can know if we're making an impact. And so it's, we have an important role there. We also have to be able to lead multidisciplinary teams. So um, unlike in days of old where we were very operational and we led groups of people that were mostly uh, kind of techies and um, uh, geeks like ourselves, we have to be able to lead groups of people that include clinicians and HIM professionals and the CFO and all those others. Um, again, ensuring compliance with the new regulations. Um, we are working a lot out of the four walls, so talking about health information exchange. Um, I've had a very active role in health information exchange in the state of Missouri, and uh, it really, really requires a different way of thinking because we're not just bounded by the walls as we were in the, in the past. Um, and again, back to the resources. So this is a scorecard that we use at Truman. We scorecard everything. Um, we have uh, um, scorecards that we use for just about anything you talk about. But again, it's all about measurement. So you see here that, I got my pointer up here. I can probably operate that. So we actually track transcription and meaningful use and some of these other things, how we're doing with document imaging. So a lot of those things are done via scorecard. So those are available to all the senior leadership, all the middle management, and we have all different kinds and sorts of scorecards that we use. This was one of the things that we had to demonstrate with our HIMSS um, stage seven is um, around the clinical and business intelligence, and this was one example. I've never actually thought that we were real, um, I mean, I think we do a great job of using intelligence, um, but I never saw us as being sort of premier in that until we had our stage seven visit and uh, the uh, surveyor for stage seven actually commented that we had an exceptional use of uh, business intelligence in the organization. So that's all great. Learned a lot of things. Um, so I guess one thing that uh, just a comment about is that, you know, we can sort of look to value-based um, purchasing as 
a way of driving change. I really think it's kind of the opposite. Driving the changes in technology or the shift. I think it's kind of the opposite. I think if we didn't have the technology, we really wouldn't be able to even consider some of the things that we're doing now. So to me, the fact that we have technology available is kind of what in some ways uh, drove that change. So I'm not going to talk to you about the value-based models because you guys have talked about that this morning. I'll talk a little bit about some of the regulatory requirements, although I think we're, we've all talked a lot about meaningful use. I'll talk a little bit about population management, just health managers to kind of tag on what Dr. Ader said, patient-centered medical home, and then some of the tools that we use and what ICIT's role is. So again, meaningful use. Um, we, same thing, 80%. This is April data, newer than February, but same. So we've gained a little bit of ground. It's now 80%, uh, half of physicians. Uh, MU1 was data capture and sharing, and then MU2 moves us to some more advanced clinical processes. I think in looking at your thing, it's kind of like we should use the you know how the Weather Channel has the temperature, the feels-like temperature? So that little skinny thing that was MU1 probably should be really big in terms of the feels-like because it felt like a huge event for us, and it was. Um, one of the things we've really got to focus on is interoperability. Yesterday I noticed in the um, healthcare IT news that um, the HIMSS EHR, um, let me get it right, association, which is 40, um, EHR vendors that are a part of this has come out with a code of conduct. Anybody see that? So this code of conduct is really about how they're going to commit to collaborate as trusted partners with all these people. You know, we've been trying to pull the industry leaders together for a long time around getting together and saying, okay, we're going to have to interoperate because this is what we need to do. Keep in mind, this is all really about the patient, or it should be. Um, also about profit and other things, but it's about the patient. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I think only one organization, I believe Siemens, has signed up for that. But um, anyway, that's going to be an interesting process. So hopefully we're moving in the right direction. So looking at population health management kind of as a driver of technology. So population health is where we're assessing the needs of a defined population and then we're providing services to improve health. Um, we really have to have value-based uh, systems to support population health management, I think, because um, otherwise doing the prevention and the wellness and those kinds of things that we don't get big reimbursement for wouldn't really be possible. So again, new types of resources. This is kind of a, a framework for population <laughs> health management, a little bit about how we can help in IT prepare for some of these. So we have to help identify the, the population and we have to record the data for the health assessment. Uh, the risk stratification has to occur. Again, that's around data. And then people are put in high, low risk based on everything from just needing preventive services to palliative care or end of life care. Um, we have to, you know, again, back to our role in health outcomes, I think it's, we are really compelled to make sure that, um, that the data is easier to get to. It's still challenging for people to get to it. I mean, we still have this kind of IT-centric ability to uh, pull data, and the average person that needs to see something still has to make a request. And until we can get to the point where um, the people that need to see this more regularly, i.e. the clinicians at the point of care or um, an analyst or whomever, can, can pull something together and have it reliable, then we've still got a long way to go, which I say we do and I think you'll all agree. Um, this a little, these are kind of some of our Truman pictures. One of the cool things we're doing, sort of tapping into the population health, is starting kind of in a basic way with um, providing fresh fruits and vegetables to the urban core. We have a farmer's market. We're also building a grocery store on 27th and Troost, and that's going to be kind of cool. Um, we're looking to be able to bring some technology into the grocery store and working with Cerner, who's our partner, to uh, hopefully look at some of those kind of things. So um, anyway, um, so a couple of things that we've done in the population health realm that have been kind of challenging and that we've learned from. is So we have an innovation grant with um, with CMS, um, Centers for, Center for Innovation. And in that grant, um, there was a lot of data that we had to provide 
to apply for the grant. We've consistently had to provide data to support that grant. This is looking at the innovation grant we're working on actually looks at very targeted zip codes, very small targeted populations of people and um, how we're, and they have very high cost of health care because they're heavy users of the ED. Most of those are in urban core Kansas City. And so we're participating in that, looking at small data uh, set, well, big data sets, but small subsets of people and how we're making an impact on that. The other thing is um, uh, we have achieved or received the Joint Commission um, accreditation or certification for our palliative care program. That was also another, a little bit of a surprise. And then as we got into that, we realized there was a huge data requirement. We also had, uh, fortunately, have some great informaticists, nurses and physicians that were able to help those folks with achieving that because it really required some workflow changes. Also, the thing that's important about the informaticists is their ability to make sure that we're actually recording the correct data. So um, having those abilities is very important. Um, so again, some of the things that um, um, we have to do to address population health management, we being the IT folks, CIOs, is of course electronic medical records. Uh, we've, we talk about that ad nauseum, but um, those are important. That's kind of the basis. Um, health information networks are huge because we have to understand what's happening to the patient across the continuum of care, where the care ga gaps are. So I think IT has a great responsibility in that. Mobile health applications, patient portals. Um, you know, we deploy the technology. I think that some of the mistakes that the industry's made in patient portals is because IT people have tried to roll those out. And uh, it's not really, um, I don't think that in a lot of cases the IT people think about um, the marketing aspect of patient portals in the way that we need to. So I think having those marketing and communications people at the table is extremely important when you're rolling out patient portals. Personal health records, the same. Registries, all kinds of cool things can happen with registries. We have a significant role in that. Everything from appointment reminders to patients, reminders to physicians, clinical decision support, all those kinds of things. Um, Patient-centered medical home, I'm not gonna talk a little bit about this. I'll just say that I have a little bit of quantification of that. So all those things you highlighted, Greg, we've also looked at. So there's 117 of the 122 components of patient-centered medical home that have an IT kind of component. And um, some obviously directly related to the work that we do on a daily basis. Um, but that was another kind of big wow surprise in terms of preparing for the impact because I said on the, the first time we met, so we are uh, working with MoHealthNet, which is Missouri Medicaid. And we are a, um, a medical home for Medicaid patients. Um, part of the, uh, so we also are a level three uh, NCQA recognized patient-centered medical home, but the data requirements and the ongoing work to um, help with workflow and support and collecting those kind of things is huge. Um, and it has really consumed a lot of our staff. So I would say that of the kind of three things, the, the things I just talked about related to treatment, that has consumed a tremendous amount of my staff on a regular basis. And at the same time, we're trying to support the operation, which makes it challenging. Um, Greg talked a little bit about patient engagement. Um, I think that um, we have a pretty significant role in patient, to, in patient engagement. We can't really do all this, this other stuff without patient engagement. Um, I think we have to, uh, patients who are engaged have a much better ability to help us all be successful in the new world. Um, we have to, according to some statistics, they say that there's a 78% greater likelihood that patients will score you higher in your quality of care if they are engaged. And it's, it's really, I think it's kind of important. So in terms of how we have to address some of those things, um, again, it's portals, it's personal health records. Um, the world's going vir virtual. Um, there's, some, there's some numbers now about, by I think it's 2017, the number of visits that will be done virtually. So in order to manage these mass populations of people to be able to prevent readmissions and those kinds of things, it's very important that we, um, that we um, have the ability to provide good context and good ability for our patients to do e-visits 
and also to email physicians where it's appropriate. And we've also got to be able to touch, reach out and touch our patients at home. And so I uh, talked a little bit about that earlier, but the whole mobile health thing, which I'll we'll sort of chat about just in a minute, is very important. Um, we can't just see the patient once a year, send them home, and never reach out and touch them again. It's really got to be, in order for them to be engaged, it's got to be kind of in a continuous sort of a thing. Part of this really requires a pretty significant, I don't know how many of you have online strategies. Uh, we're just working to build our online strategy. Um, we kind of thought about it as a mobile strategy, but it's really everything from social media to all those kinds of things that patients can do to engage online. And uh, it's, a, it's a process, and it's a process for the organization as well. Um, just a little bit about mobile health. I'm not going to talk about this a whole lot, uh, but this is going to be a $6 billion industry by 2016. Uh, there's 10,000 health-related apps, and I'd probably say that every day there's a new one that's coming out. My son is just finished a master's program in technology commercialization from the University of Texas in Austin. Go Longhorns. I shouldn't say that in the area, but I did. Um, so um, in, his, in that work, I must have talked to, his class was probably 30 people. Um, I must have talked to 10 of them that were helping to build a mobile health app. So all these, I'll say kids, coming out of school, have this ability to use that technology to build an app. And um, of course, you know, healthcare is, is a great place for technology. So they're seeing that as kind of the, you know, the, uh, the, the golden egg. And, um, and it's, it's kind of interesting. To, I mean, they've got great ideas, but you kind of go, well, has anybody done this? And I always ask them, well, how are you going to make money off of this? You know, that's kind of the big question. Um, so um, a lot of the benefits are, again, being able to work in a virtual setting, being able to reach out and touch the patients. Um, very low cost point of entry. I mean, if, if physicians will prescribe, um, if they'll prescribe apps and they'll, they'll, they'll touch their patients with the use of those apps and it's specific, I mean, apps are what, two, three, four dollars, sometimes ten. If you know, does it? Who who all has a health app on their iPhone? Wait, bit, bit, something like that. Most everybody does. I mean, it's a huge number of people that have some kind of health app. So it's not like we're not used to that technology. The question I have as a CIO and in really building our online or our communication uh, strategy outside of the the normal kind of IT strategy is how are we going to support those? So what do we have to do to be able to help implement those? And, and also, how do we integrate that on the back end? What's their role going to be? And I think it's going to, it could be pretty significant. Um, and of course, we all have to worry about good old HIPAA. So we have all this ability. We want to be able to balance security with convenience. We want to be able to balance costs, but we still want to make things accessible anytime, anywhere. So um, I won't go into this in any great deal, but these are some of the things that we have to consider in helping the organization understand the use of mobile health. And it's really helping them understand what our main goals are. What are we really trying to accomplish? Are we trying to compete in the market? Are we trying to, again, use this for population health? Are we trying to improve, use it for wellness? What's the real goal there? Um, do we have the right analytics structure? in place to be able to support it? Um, do we have the right people that know how to use those kinds of things? Um, and um, uh, how are they using health apps today? How can we support them? Um, and so in the plan for adoption, um, a lot of times the apps can be rolled out with a remote patient monitoring system. That works very well. Um, and uh, it's certainly something that requires a different kind of resource within the IT organization. Um, some of the technology needs around training. Um, and then, um, again, looking at the kind of the mobile health sort of formulary that we can help our clinicians be able to support. So just a real quick, and I know that everybody's ready to go. It's getting to be four, so I'm going to kind of, I'm trying to speed up here. I'm a Texan, so I talk pretty fast anyway. Um, and again, demand for skills is huge. Um, we've gone over some of these statistics today, but um, lots of skills, 50,000 healthcare IT-related jobs have been 
uh, grown out of all this work. Um, although we talked a little bit earlier with some of the folks about it's not as easy to get entry into the health IT field and capture those jobs as one would hope, just because of the fact that we need, CIOs need experience. And so there's probably some ways that we can help with that too. Um, so we're, we're increasing our operating costs. We're, some are increasing staff. In the case of Truman, we've actually been able to kind of, we've kind of consolidated some staff because we have, we've had to buy higher skills. And in some cases, we don't need, um, we had more of the lower skills, we have higher skills now, but it's much more expensive. So a couple of the roles, uh, again, the CMIO is huge. Um, I would say that I sort of, in a way, kind of feel popular in the organization now. I used to not, I used to always feel like I had a target on my back, but because I have a really great CMIO who keeps the physicians um, away from me, <laughs> <laughs> who keeps them away from our CEO, which is even better, um, not, not, not meaning that disparagingly, but true, he, he solves their problems and answers their questions, and so they're happy, and they're also, he helps them focus on how to continue to move forward and also helps them understand the impact of what they're doing. Um, I have a nursing informatics director and, and a small nursing informatics team and, and those nurses are huge. They all have uh, bedside experience. Um, most of them had bedside experience at Truman prior to taking those roles. So they really can talk one-to-one -one with the nurses and also have a good understanding of how we need to integrate this in nursing workflow. Because keep in mind, um, you know, a lot of us that come from pure technology backgrounds or business backgrounds, um, we know how to lay out the, the technology and what it'll do, but we don't really know how to make it work well, as well as it can within the workflow of the clinician. And a part of that too is just being a translator. So, you know, you get in a room with a number of clinicians and you get the, the, the technical folks in the room and you really kind of need somebody to translate the English to the German. Because, um, you know, we've gained that confidence with our clinicians at Truman through working through all this over the last few years, but it still helps to have those individuals, the clinicians in there, really making sure we're understanding each other. One of the things we don't have, but I would love to have, but it's becoming more common in organizations, is the chief knowledge officer. And that's the, the person that's really responsible for all the big data to really make sure that they have, those people have very high skills. I think you probably see them in some of the larger academic institutions. But those folks um, really bring all the business and clinical intelligence together and have enough clinical understanding to be able to, to work with the clinicians. Um, informatics experts are absolutely needed in the industry. There's a huge demand for them. Um, they, they too have to, a lot of theirs is, is workflow and understanding how to capture data. So all these, you know, if we don't, um, the EMR that comes out of the box, or at least for us with Cerner, doesn't have all the data elements that we need to capture so that we can do all these things. And part of that's an evolution with the vendor too. So we've had to really make sure that we're capturing things that we can report on in a way that we can demonstrate um, the things that we're doing. Um, the other thing is, I'll just have to say is, um, I don't know where meaningful use sits in a lot of organizations, but in our, ours, I was sort of the go-to person. So as the CIO, I was looked at as the person that had to know everything about meaningful use. So I spent hours and hours combing through the legislation, making sure I knew everything that I could know about it. I also had, um, have had the great opportunity to speak uh, to a number of audiences about meaningful use. I went and talked to uh, the meaningful use work group about some of the challenges we had. This was back in February of 2010. But it's, a, it's, a, it's very consuming. So I have a person now that really is managing and working with the, uh, the physicians, working on looking at the data every day from the reports that we get to make sure that we're moving in the right direction and keeps up with all the legislation. So um, that's been great. And I can't say enough for people with um, good project management skills. Project management is, is huge in any organization. It's often lacking on the clinical side. So another impact that people that have kind of an IT background can have is just being able to bring all the pieces together, get things moving forward, start with the beginning and have an end in mind and manage the time in between. Um, those folks are huge. These are the people that we have um, 
So we have an integrated record on Cerner. We have it across ambulatory, inpatient. These are all the kinds of people that we have. So we have trainers that are, that are specific. We have biomed and HIM and IT. All those things coming together has been very helpful. And you can't see this, I'm sure. But uh, we also, our governance committee that we established about five years ago when I came to Truman, we called the Enterprise Technology Advisory Committee. This uh, group of people is all the leadership of the organization for the most part, with the exception of the CEO. And it has representation from clinical, uh, PR marketing, you name it. Everybody who's in a leadership role in the organization sits on our advisory committee. Again, that's back, kind of back to the education part of what we have to do, kind of the marketing. Uh, but helping people understand the processes that we need to have and tying, because those people also support these different board committees, tying all that together has been extremely helpful. Um, so educational needs going forward, uh, we've got to have continued ongoing computer skills, we've got to have information literacy, and all those things are important in our workers of the future. And that's it, and I think I'm just right after four, so maybe a little earlier than we had projected. Good. Anybody may have questions. Great. Well, thank you, Mitzi. Do we have any questions from the audience for Mitzi? Thinking of your patients in Midtown, Truman, mm -hmm. and you mentioned patient engagement um, along with the portal and email. So, with your demographics, is that a challenge to engage them and them have a method to electronically communicate? You know, interestingly enough, there's about I think the recent studies show that about 58 percent of adults have smartphones, and so um, in in the case of other studies have shown that people that have uh, Medicaid patients or people that don't have insurance sometimes are more willing to engage in using the kinds of things that don't require them to have to go into a hospital or to an ED. Um, and so uh, I think that they're as willing to use the tools as anybody provided and they have some way to do it. Uh, Greg mentioned library. Library is important to us. We have a big partnership with the library. Um, we are going to have kiosk in the organization as well so that they have those abilities. But the things that we can deliver, if, even in our population, if you walk down the hall, just about everybody's got a smartphone that they're doing something with. And um, the, the ways that we can use that kind of technology, I think, are going to support them. It's still a challenge, though. Joe? Well, uh, yeah, just to go right off to that, um, actually, looking at uh, mobile, the highest rate of growth of, of internet usage um, uh, among minority groups is mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, Latinos have a higher rate of use uh, proportionately, African American groups. And within Kansas City, a couple of years ago, it was reported that that was where the greatest growth. So your movement to try and get mobile access to things really becomes key to, the, to these groups. And um, looking at, at other areas, I was talking with the CIO of uh, Magnolia Regional Medical Center in Corinth, Mississippi, which has the dubious honor of having the highest readmission rate of any hospital in the state of Mississippi. Wow. Uh, and he was looking for solutions to, to try and, and have ways to connect patients. And the first response from his board was, do, do you know your population? These people don't have computers. He said, I walk through the, every day on my way to the office, I walk through the waiting room, and everybody I see has got a smartphone, and they're tapping away mm -hmm. on it. So there, there really are, across the economic spectrum, there are ways to connect if you're just flexible. Mm -hmm. I just want to say I think your uh, comment about don't send the IT people to tell them about the portal, to send someone that's uh, communications interpersonal is, is so important. If they don't grasp it initially, you, you just have to, you have to special, especially in the uh, patient-centered care arena, mm -hmm. it's a whole different way of thinking. And, and I think we have to um, educate, educate not just ourselves, but educate our, pa our patients Absolutely. and consumers. I think the best way to get patients to use um, the, the portal and to use a personal health record is for that physician to tell them that that's, that that's how they want to communicate and that's how they're going to get information, almost like a prescription, if you will. 
that's where we've seen the best success. I also have been I'm fortunate. I started my career in marketing. And so I, you know, I, when we were trying to design the portal, and, you know, and we've looked at, I remember um, when I was uh, talking to the Meaningful Use Work Group in D.C., and one of the people on the panel said, I just don't understand why personal health records haven't pick, been picked up. Why don't you all have plans to do it? And it's kind of like, well, you know, if it were really easy, we, wouldn't, we would have done all this stuff already. This was before we had our first incentive payments. And the thing that's challenging about portals is you really have to, you know, there has to be an incentive for somebody to go there. I mean, there's a statistic that says 10% of the people that engage with their portal have improved their health. Well, that's not very many because, you know, if, I mean, if it's, it's another thing to have to remember to do. And so you have to market it the right way and you have to put the kind of wrapper around it, I think, that will make it successful. Any other questions? Uh, question from the top there. Oh. It's a great, great talk. Um, it's interesting what you just said there. Uh, Epic has done some studies to say that you have to have 44% of your patients signed up for the portal in order to be able to meet the MU2 kind of return, you know, because of just the attrition and all those things. So yep. it's, and, and we've found that exactly that if the doctor drives it, the numbers just shoot up. Yeah. So that's, that's exactly right. I had a couple of questions. Do you, do you have any uh, thoughts on is it the role of the CIO's office or, or just who to help your physicians with their uh, social media operation, you know, like how to do it, how to maybe have a public, a private life, how to, how to not uh, commit uh, various infractions of the rules around HIPAA, et cetera, and, and to be safe. Do you have any thoughts around that? We kind of, social media at Truman kind of falls in the PR and the marketing department. However, I think we do have a role in that. I mean, I, I, I would challenge, and this is just personal opinion, I would challenge us to think that we have to help our clinicians be successful in whatever way they're communicating with patients. Because if for no other reason, then there's a financial end to the game of that kind of patient engagement. But it's also just because that's our job. I mean, you know, again, I have a great relationship. We have a great relationship in IT with our clinical staff. A lot of that's because of the clinicians we have that glue us together. But I, I do believe we have a, have a role in that. Yeah. I have one more if there's anybody else. What, what about, uh, what is, you know, I suspect that our uh, work, uh, clinical staff uh, demographics would be very similar. Do you, do you have a, do you, is social media, what, what is the corporate policy on social media for your employees? Um, or, I don't know, you may not know it. But. No, no, I do, I do know it because it's been, it was a big kind of a controversy, but, um, so we don't, uh, we don't. That's why I brought it. Yeah, thanks, I appreciate that. It's still a bit of a controversy. So we, at, within the walls of the organization, we, don't really give access to Facebook and YouTube except to certain groups that need that. And um, that's, uh, I think we are changing that model. There's been some uh, concern on behalf of the, particularly nursing leadership about people, you know, those, I mean, Facebook can be addictive. You know, you get on there for five minutes and you go for a long time. Um, so I think there was some concern about that. But obviously now for the, um, the healthcare impact, I mean, YouTube videos, those kinds of things are, I think, becoming much more important to have access to that for clinical staff as well as uh, anyone. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're working through that. We have a similar stance, so uh, we're in the same <laughs> Maybe we need to talk about that yeah. later. <laughs> All right. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? Well, Missy, thank you very much. We Thanks. appreciate your time today and uh, coming out for us and being the last presenter today. Um, I know that's a tough position to be in, but thank you. You owe me for that. Yes, I owe you. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, so let's give her a round of applause and thank you.